Um, another thing I forgot to uh, rant about on Wednesday is calculators. Um, this class, like your engineering 120 series and all that kind of stuff, requires you to only use FE approved calculators. Um, so no graphing calculators or anything like that. Technically speaking, any of the FE approved calculators will work. That being said, I do have some particular recommendations, okay? Uh, for the first two thirds of the class, I would highly recommend if you have not already purchased one, uh, getting your hands on a Casio 991 calculator. The reason why I suggest you guys use the Casio 991 calculator is because it is capable of solving systems of equations that contains four unknown quantities, which is one more unknown quantity than any of the other ones. So it's technically a more powerful calculator. It is the most powerful calculator you're allowed to use. Um, so that's why I recommend that particular one. I'm not paid by Casio or anything like that, but it is a very good calculator to use. For the last third of the class, I actually prefer to use a TI-36X, okay? Um, the reason why I prefer to use the TI-36X is because for that last third of the class, we're going to be dealing with a lot of complex numbers. And the TI calculators don't require you to literally switch the mode of your calculator to do complex number manipulation. Um, also, uh, the TI-36X calculator has more memory. So you can do longer and more calculated, or excuse me, longer and more complicated complicated calculations with that particular calculator without it giving you errors. And also it is easier to store variables into memory. And when we're dealing with complex numbers, it's gonna be a lot of bookkeeping and things like that, um, that it's gonna be a huge pain in the ass to write everything down and make sure you don't get mistakes typing stuff in. So if it's really easy to store variables, you'll get the right answer much more often. So um, you can do all of the stuff that we're gonna do in this class with either of those calculators or the Casio FX115, which a lot of you guys purchased for whatever reason. Um, I cannot recommend highly enough though that if you have a TI-30X, you spend the extra $15 and get yourself a non-peasant calculator. Um, that one just cannot, do the work that you need it to do in this class in a timely fashion. Um, so you will, that the 15 to $20 that a better calculator costs is well worth the money if you're using a TI-30. So just wanted to be there. Uh, for those of you that are using um, HPs, I think you're sociopaths and I don't understand it, so. All right. So what we are going to be talking about today is basic electrical quantities. Plugged in and charging, yeah. Thank you, Corey. All right, so I'm gonna give you guys an option. Would you rather start talking about voltage first or current first? This is a choose your own adventure lecture. Voltage, okay. So <clears throat> voltage is probably the electrical quantity that you are most familiar with already um, because you guys have, arguably changed a battery at some point in your life, and that is a voltage source. Hold on, um, just let me save this. Sorry, this little error is gonna keep popping up and driving me insane, so I'm gonna close this out. Ignore my horrifying desktop. Yeah, I, at some point I will have to spend the time to go through and delete stuff. I use this computer for like this program and I have 95 things else on it, um, so. Yeah, it's real bad. It's real, real bad. Hold on. Uh, yeah, I don't disagree with you. All right, so voltage. Uh, like I said, this is the quantity that you guys are most familiar with. 
um, we are going to introduce a more formal description um, that will suit our purposes, okay? So mathematically, voltage, VBA, and I'll talk about what these subscripts mean here in a moment, is equal to the line integral from A to B of the electric field vector E dotted into a differential line element, DL. So how many of you have any idea what the hell any of that means? About a third of you, that's great. Okay, for those of you who don't know what that crap means, that's perfectly okay. We are never gonna actually use this definition of voltage, not even once. Yeah, so mathematically, this is what voltage means. We are gonna talk about what this equation represents and from there we will develop relationships for voltage, okay? So I'm gonna introduce something else to you guys outside of the scope of this class, but I'm gonna to try to tie it to things that you are familiar with. So there is a quantity called an electrostatic force, F sub E, okay? And the electrostatic force is nothing more than Q, which is the charge of an electron, times the electric field vector. So if we, if, if we mathematically manipulate this electrostatic force equation, what we can find is that our voltage is one over Q times the line integral from A to B of our electrostatic force F sub E dotted into our differential line element DL. So one of you mechanical engineers, tell me what everything to the right of one over Q is. Work, exactly right. Force, the integral of force dot DL is the classical definition of work. So from this, we can say that voltage is simply the work or energy required per unit charge needed to move one coulomb of charge from location A to location B in a circuit, okay? So effectively, anytime we see or experience a voltage, we have the potential for a transfer of energy, okay? Um, what are the units of voltage? So voltage is measured in volts, where one volt is equal to one joule per one coulomb or work over charge. So our definition even tells us what the units are supposed to be for this particular quantity, okay? So that's one way to think about voltage, and it is the more physics way of thinking about voltage. Um, in this class, we are actually going to use a slightly different definition. It means the same thing, but it's a little bit easier for us to apply, um, and it comes from the behavior of line integrals. So who knows anything about line integrals? So are line integrals path dependent or path independent? You would be incorrect. It does not matter from way, what path you take to go from A to B, you're going to get the same exact result. That's the, the role of the dot product in that math, okay? So effectively, What this integral represents is the difference 
in potential between uh, surfaces at different potentials, okay? Um, I know that's weird hippie stuff that you're not particularly familiar with, but what the line integral evaluation breaks down to is that um, an alternative definition for voltage is simply the difference in electric potential energy between two points. And then in parentheses here, I'm going to say nodes because that's what I really mean by points. in a circuit. This is the definition that we are going to use. This is the definition that you all are kind of actually already inherently familiar with. So let me explain what I mean by that. I am going to draw a crappy picture of a AAA battery. Okay. What is the voltage that is provided by a AAA battery, 1.5 volts, okay? So that is the magnitude of the voltage, okay? This battery has two terminals, one at the top, that's typically the positive polarity terminal, and one at the bottom, that is the negative polarity terminal. So this battery has a 1.5 volt potential difference between the positive polarity terminal and the negative polarity terminal. Therefore, it has a voltage associated with it, okay? We're gonna do the same thing for generic circuit elements, resistors, capacitors, inductors, and all of that kind of stuff. Whenever we want to define a voltage drop, it's always going to be across an element or combination of elements or something like that. So that it's always going to be measured between two different points or two different nodes in a circuit, okay? Um, so in a circuit, and we briefly mentioned this here, Voltages are defined by their magnitude and their polarity, okay? So in your Engineering 120 series classes, you talked about voltage drops and voltage rises. I hate that with a passion um, because there's no signs associated with it, so it's hard to tell what things are. In the Engineering 120 series, all of that worked because you were only ever dealing with a single voltage source in a circuit, but because I am a jerk, you will be dealing with multiple voltage sources and things like that. And so it's gonna be hard to conceptualize the concept of voltage drops and voltage rises. So instead we assign polarities to terminals, okay? So our battery here has a positive polarity terminal and a negative polarity terminal. So for this battery, that means that the one point, uh, excuse me, the positive polarity terminal is 1.5 volts higher than the negative polarity terminal. Okay, that's literally all that means. It does not matter what potential is at this node, the positive potential is one and a half volts higher because that's what the battery's job is, okay? So for a generic circuit element, so let's say that we have circuit element A, like so, we can express the concept of polarity in multiple different ways, okay? So I'm going to start with the way that I do it most often in this class. Um, I'm going to assign a plus sign with one terminal and a minus sign with the other terminal. So I could say here that the voltage drop across element A is, let's say for the sake of argument, five volts with the positive polarity on top. 
So we have a fully defined voltage because we have a magnitude of five volts and we have identified which of the two terminals is the positive polarity term, okay? Now, what would happen if we flipped the polarities of our terminals? So let's call this voltage VA prime. It is the exact same thing as our voltage VA, but the polarities are switched. So what would we expect to see if we had hooked a multimeter up and then we swap the leads? A negative voltage, absolutely right. So swapping the polarities is the same as changing the sign on the voltage. That's all it means, okay? Our choice of polarities is completely and utterly arbitrary for the most point. Um, we're just gonna get in the habit of assigning them in a specific way to get rid of as many negative signs in the math as possible. That's even not really required. I'm just notoriously bad at keeping track of all those negative signs. So I set my equations up in a way to where I'm gonna make the least amount of mistakes, okay? So this is the conventional or American style of expressing polarity, okay? Now, some of you will likely supplement my lectures with YouTube videos and other things like that. Perfectly and utterly reasonable thing to do when stuff doesn't make sense and you're interested in figuring out how to get better at it, you watch videos and things like that. So the European style of expressing polarity is done using an arrow. And the arrow is directed from the negative polarity terminal to the positive polarity terminal. So we would still have our magnitude statement, VA, is equal to five volts. And then the arrow tells us what the polarities are. So the head of the arrow is the positive polarity terminal. The tail of the arrow is the negative polarity terminal. And similarly, if our arrow changed directions, this would be VA is equal to negative five volts. Now, I don't particularly like this style of expressing voltage polarity, okay? Um, the reason why I don't like this style is because to me, arrows are associated with currents, okay? Um, when we deal with currents in our circuits, currents are gonna have both a magnitude and a direction where the direction is indicated by an arrow. So anytime I see an arrow, I immediately associate that with a current. And so the European style of expressing voltages confuses me just because it's not how I learned it, okay? I wanted to make you guys aware of it so that when you watch videos to supplement all this garbage I'm talking about, and you happen to watch some guy from, I don't know, Britain or Australia teach you about circuits better than I'm doing, you will understand what the hell these arrows mean. All right. And our last description is going to go similar to what we had with our voltage definition. So this is what's gonna be called the double subscript notation or double subscript style. Okay. So in the double subscript style, we assign each of our terminals a designation. So it could be numbers, it could be letters. So let's say that this is terminal one and this is terminal two. The voltage one, two would be equal to five volts. The voltage two, one would be equal to negative five volts. Okay. So here's how the double subscript notation works. The first character in the subscript is the positive polarity terminal. The second character in the subscript is the negative polarity terminal, full stop. No pluses, no minuses, no arrows, 
the notation tells us what the positive polarity and negative polarity terminals are, okay? Um, we are going to effectively use this notation style when we get into nodal analysis. We're actually gonna be using a combination of the American style and the double subscript notation style. So I just wanted to make you guys aware of it. This particular style also reinforces the fact that voltage is nothing more than the potential difference between two points because it gives you the two points that the potential difference occurs over, okay? So these are the three different ways that you might see voltages expressed, all right? All right, so now let's talk about voltage sources. That's not a V. So this is not a definitive list. This is just what we are going to see in this particular class. So I'm going to start. with this guy. This is a battery. Technically, this symbol is for a multi-cell battery. So if you had um, two uh, AA batteries stacked together to make a three volt source, this was how you would represent that. Um, okay, so the long line is the positive polarity terminal of this battery. And the shorter line is the negative polarity terminal of the battery. And then the voltage that's being supplied by the battery is its magnitude, which I'm just gonna call Vs. I don't regularly use this representation of voltage sources in this class, okay? Um, in your Engineering 120 series, this was perfectly fine because you guys didn't deal with capacitors particularly often. In this class, we are going to deal with capacitors quite a lot. And the uh, schematic symbol for a capacitor is two parallel lines. So if you're lazy drawing a battery symbol, it can look too much like a capacitor for my level of comfort. So I don't use this symbol very much. You guys use it all through your Engineering 120 series. So I just wanted to let you know it is a thing that is correct. Okay. What I prefer to use instead is a generic voltage source symbol. So this is gonna be a DC voltage source where the positive polarity terminal is clearly identified with a plus sign and the negative polarity terminal is clearly identified with a minus sign. Okay. The amount of voltage that is supplied by the source is designated by its magnitude. In this case, we're gonna call it VS. A battery is an example of a generic DC voltage source. So I replace all of my batteries with this symbol in the circuits and stuff like that that I'm going to draw, okay? Um, so functionally, these two things are identical. They're both supply DC um, voltage, um, but I find the symbol on the right less confusing. Now, uh, much later in the class, we are going to deal with AC voltage sources. This has the exact same symbol, but there's a little squiggle in the mid middle of it to tell us that the voltage is changing as a function of time. And from that, we will represent our time varying voltage as a function of time. Uh, one thing that I wanna point out here, this isn't carried out in your web works, but I'm gonna try to do it all throughout my notes. Whenever we have a DC quantity, I am going to use capital letters. Whenever we have an AC or time varying quantity, I'm going to use lowercase letters so that you can easily distinguish between the two different types of signals that we're gonna deal with, okay? So these three sources are all what we call independent sources. Okay. 
what this independent source concept means is that the voltage that is supplied by these sources is independent of any other quantity, meaning the battery has a voltage of Vs across its terminals regardless of what it is connected to, okay? Does not matter what's connected to it, even if it's nothing, even if it's a short circuit or something like that, we consider that voltage to be fixed, unchanging cannot be anything other than that. So there is a fixed potential difference between those two points of a particular value, okay? Now we're gonna deal with our dependent sources, which you guys are going to hate for the time being, but with a little practice, you'll get better at dealing with them. Okay. So there are two different types of dependent sources or dependent voltage sources and they have the exact same schematic symbol okay so on the left is going to be a voltage controlled voltage source vcvs and on the right is going to be a current controlled voltage source ccvs okay so Anytime we have, actually, let me do this here. These are dependent. So anytime we have a rhombus or diamond symbol, that indicates a dependent source. Anytime we have a circle symbol, that indicates an independent source, okay? So now let's get into the nitty gritty of a voltage controlled voltage source. So as the name suggests, the voltage that is being supplied by this voltage source is controlled by some external voltage. So for this guy, we might see something that looks like K times some voltage Vx, where K is a scaling constant that has units of volts per volt, okay? So some voltage Vx is elsewhere in the circuit, this particular voltage source gives us a voltage of Vx multiplied by some scaling factor, okay? Over here on the far right, we have a current controlled voltage source. So this is going to be, let me think about the units, volts per amp, R times Ix, where this quantity R has units of volts per amp, okay? So a current somewhere else in the circuit controls the amount of voltage that this particular voltage source supplies, okay? So I want to talk about this and reinforce this a little bit more because this is where students see a lot of confusion, okay? Both of these dependent sources are voltage sources. Regardless of whether it's controlled by a voltage or controlled by a current, these are voltage sources. Do you know how you can tell that they're voltage sources? Because they have a plus and minus sign associated with them. Anytime you have the positive and negative polarity clearly defined like that, you are dealing with a voltage source. It does not matter what controls it, if anything, okay? Um, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because you guys will forget about things and you'll see a current I and you'll say, oh, there's a current associated with it. So it must be a current source. And then you'll treat it as such. And that's incorrect. Okay. So anytime the source has a plus and minus sign associated with it like this, it is a voltage source. It's providing a voltage. The voltage controlled, excuse me, the current controlled voltage source converts current into a voltage through that scaling factor R. Okay. All right, um, does anybody have any questions regarding the concept of voltage, how we represent it in circuits, how we will see it being supplied by sources? Everything that I've talked about to this point seems fairly reasonable. Yes? Right. So if we multiply that scaling quantity 
R, which has units of volts per amp, times the controlling current measured in amps, the output is in volts. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's why I very explicitly told you what the units of the scaling factors are. So you, uh, when we analyze circuits and things like that, unless you're told otherwise, these are the units that you're expected to remember and apply. Because it's quite likely that instead of seeing three volts per amp times the current IY, it's just gonna, uh, on the, the schematic diagram, it's just gonna say four IY. And you're expected to know or remember that that four has implied units of volts per amp, which converts the controlling current into the output voltage. Okay. Any other questions? All right, so let's talk about current. All right, so current and charge, okay? So mathematically, current is simply, so let's say I of T, in case we have a time varying current, is the derivative of some time varying charge q of t with respect to time. Okay. So effectively, we can say that current is the rate at which charge passes some point damn it in a circuit All right, so this is pretty much in line with what you guys learned in your engineering 120 class, charge over time is current. It's the same thing here, except now we know enough calculus to throw a derivative in there for the hell of it, effectively. All right, so current is just the rate at which charge passes through um, a circuit. So we can mathematically manipulate this expression to develop a mathematical relationship for charge in terms of current, okay? So charge Q of T is going to be the integral from what I'm going to call T naught to T I of T prime DT prime plus Q at T naught. There's a lot of things to unpack here, okay? This is a whole bunch of mathematical gobbledygook to describe something that you guys probably felt pretty confident about before I wrote this down, okay? So let's talk about T prime first. T prime here is a dummy variable for the quantity time. It is not the derivative, the first derivative of variable T, okay? In this class, I will never use primes to indicate derivatives. Some of your math teachers and all that kind of stuff have done that in the past. In this class, if we're dealing with a first derivative, I'm going to have d by dt. If we're dealing with a second derivative, I'm going to have d squared by dt squared kind of thing. I'm going to explicitly tell you that we are taking the derivative with respect to time. So we're never going to use primes to indicate a derivative. We're never going to use dots to indicate derivatives with respect to time all of our derivatives will be very explicit when we are required to do them, okay? So this is just a dummy variable representing time. Now, 
some people use Greek letters as dummy variables to represent things. So the Greek representation of T would be the letter tau, but unfortunately in electrical engineering, tau has a very specific meaning related to the time constant of a signal. So we can't use that symbol. It's already in use in common electrical engineering practice. So we have to use, or I choose to use T prime. If you wanted to use X, where you remember that X represents time, that's perfectly reasonable as well. This is all just mathematical semantics. The reason why I can't put T here or here is because T is in the limits of my integration and it'll be too damn confusing. That is the only reason we are using a dummy variable, okay? So we are integrating a function of time between two points in time is what's going on here, okay? All right, so I feel like I've relatively explained this bit right here, okay? Arguably, you're catching what I'm throwing. We'll put it into practice in a little bit. What this thing right here on the right-hand side represents is effectively an initial condition, okay? So we can't know what the charge at a particular instant in time is without knowing how the charge was behaving in the past. That's what this part right here represents. Some amount of known charge at some very specific instant in time, okay? The only way to get around that would be to integrate this thing from negative infinity up until the time that we are interested in, and we would have to know how it behaves over all time, which isn't particularly useful, useful or realistic. So instead we can say, well, if we know what the time was at T is equal to three seconds, we can figure out how the charge uh, behaving at some later point in time using that old value. That's all this equation represents, okay? So let's work a quick example problem thing here, okay? So our vertical axis is current measured in amps. Our horizontal axis is time measured in seconds. Um, let's call this five seconds. Let's call this 10 seconds. And let's call this one amp. If, um, let's say that we want to find Q at eight seconds, if Q at zero was equal to one Coulomb. Okay. So let's start with the easier question. Which of the two equations are we supposed to use here? The charge equation. We're trying to find charge. So use the one that says Q is equal to other stuff. Absolutely correct. Doesn't have to be any harder than that. Okay. Now I gave you guys a mathematical relationship that we can use here and we could absolutely figure this out. Uh, so what I mean by that is we could define Q of T as a piecewise function. Um, so the slope of this line is one amp for every five seconds. So that's 0 0.2 amps per second times t over the interval from zero is less than t is less than five seconds. And then it has a constant value. Sorry, this, this would be i of t, not q of t. My apologies. Um, one amp for zero less than t, this is gonna be five seconds less than t, less than 10 seconds, and then it's zero everywhere else. 
right? That's our piecewise definition. We can absolutely formally perform this integral. Why would we ever want to do that? We have a triangle and a rectangle, okay? So um, calculus is required in this class in some cases, but pretty much any time I give you a graph that you need to evaluate, expect rectangles, squares, and triangles. The area under the curve is just adding up the areas of those individual shapes. And then we'll go from there, okay? Uh, the level of calculus that you're actually going to need in this class is being able to take the derivative and integral of sine functions, cosine functions, and exponential functions, and that's about it, okay? So anything else, expect easy, breezy shapes like this. So the integral of this thing would then represent this area, which we'll call A1, and this area, which we'll call A2. A1, what's the area of a right triangle? Half base time site. Great. I, I'm asking you guys this because I had a section of circuits one summer, several years back. 20 students, seven of them did not know how to find the area of a right triangle. Blew my mind. Yeah. So one half base times height. So in this case, the base is five seconds. The height is one amp. And then we have a two, which is a rectangle. So that is just base times height. So that is 10 seconds minus five seconds times one amp. Um, so let's see, one half of five is two and a half amp seconds, which is a coulomb, five times one, is five amp seconds, which is a coulomb. So Q of eight seconds is going to be A1 plus A2 plus Q at zero, which is two and a half coulombs plus five coulombs plus one coulomb is 8.5 coulombs, okay. Um, Doing this, I realized that I did not tell you guys what the unit of current is. I know that you're familiar with it, so I'm going to backtrack here and just throw that in really quickly. The unit of current is the ampere, where one ampere is equal to one coulomb per one second. The unit of charge is the coulomb, and that's like a fundamental unit. You can't break it down into anything else. All right, so um, let's go ahead and skip to another page here so that I don't have to cram everything down at the bottom. Let's talk about representing currents in circuits. So here I have a generic circuit element A again. And then the ellipses at the top and the ellipses at the bottom just represent that this circuit element is connected to some other part of a larger circuit, okay? So currents are defined both by their magnitude, which is what you guys dealt with in your freshman classes, and their direction, um, which is something that you guys have not yet dealt with, okay? So let's say that we have a current of three amps flowing through element A. If I don't specify a direction for this current to flow, I have not fully defined my current, okay? So anytime we have a current, we also need to specify a direction and we do that by using an arrow symbol. So in this particular circuit element, IA is three amps with a reference direction of down. So how much current would be flowing up? negative three amps, exactly right. So we could say that IA prime is negative three amps, okay? This is the only way we're going to represent currents in this class. Now, technically, you can represent them using a double subscript notation. They start at one node and end at the next node, but we don't ever really do that here. 
Um, for those of you who go into circuits two and all that kind of stuff, when we get into three phase circuits, we'll do that a lot. But for you guys, it's completely and utterly unnecessary. So I'm not going to mention it further. All right. So <clears throat> anytime we want to get rid of a negative sign on a current, we simply change the direction of the arrow. Those two things are paired together. Okay. So if we're ever calculating a current, um, and we get a negative value, it simply means that we assumed the direction wrong. We change the direction, we get a positive value, everything works out great, all right? Okay, now let's talk about current sources. So before we give you the schematic symbols and all that kind of stuff, um, how many of you guys have ever seen a current source? John, were you raising your hand or are you stretching? A what? An amplifier for a car. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Um, so we are used to literally going to a big box store and being able to effectively buy a voltage source because we can go to any Walmart, even gas stations, and buy batteries and stuff like that. So we all have some fundament fundamental understanding of what voltage sources physically are. There are several DC voltage sources literally scattered around the perimeter of this room. You're going to use one of them later on today in the lab assignment, okay? Current sources are actually a lot more rare. They are specialized pieces of electrical equipment that are based on very complicated transistor circuitry, okay? So in this class, we are just going to deal with idealized current sources. We're never going to get into the internal circuitry or anything like that. We just have this magic black box that's able to push current through a circuit. And I'm okay with us having that level of understanding. It's really not even until you get into your like, your like senior level electrical engineering classes where you figure out how true current sources actually work because the behavior is so difficult. All right. So our first representation of a current source is this guy. So this is a DC current source. Where the direction of current flow is indicated by the arrow. And the magnitude of the current that's flowing is given by some numerical value or some magnitude, which I'm just calling IS here. Okay. Over here, we will have our AC current source, exact same symbol, but now we put a squiggle in the middle of it to say that the current changes in time. And because we have a time varying current, I'm gonna represent the magnitude IS as a function of time. And once again, because it's changing in time, I'm using lowercase letters as opposed to uppercase letters which I typically reserve for DC quantities, okay? These two are examples of independent current sources. And that simply means that they've supply that fixed amount of current regardless of what they are connected to. Over on the right hand side here, we are going to have our dependent current sources, and they are going to be two of them with, again, the exact same schematic symbol. We are going to have a current controlled current source and a voltage controlled current source. These are dependent sources. which means that the amount of current they supply is dependent on some controlling quantity elsewhere in the circuit. So our current controlled current source supplies an amount of current that is K times IX, where in this case, our scaling quantity K has units of amps per amps or its units. So if you can't tell, K is the letter I use for when things don't have units. Okay. 
for our voltage controlled current source, we are going to have G times Vx, where G is our transconductance scaling factor. So it converts voltage into current. So it has units of amps per volt. So once again, despite the fact that this is controlled by a voltage Vx, this is a current source. We can tell that these two things on the right are current sources because there's an arrow in the middle of it instead of a plus and minus sign, okay? So anytime it's got an arrow in the middle of it, it's a current source. Anytime it's got a plus and minus in the middle of it, it's a voltage source, regardless of what it's controlled by. All right, anybody have any questions? Yes. So, uh, current sources and voltage sources, if the like, current controlled and the voltage controlled and the voltage, how will it be made that they so the controlling variable tells you which type it is. So if it depends on a voltage, it's a voltage controlled something. If it depends on a current, it's a current controlled something. So you can tell, so, so let's say, all right, uh, let, let's do some things here. So let's say that I have this guy here. This is a voltage controlled voltage source, okay? It's a voltage source because it has a plus and minus sign. And it's a voltage controlled voltage source because the controlling variable is a voltage. This is a voltage controlled current source. It's a current source because there's an arrow in the middle of it, and it's voltage controlled because the variable is a voltage. Yes, you you absolutely have to. Yeah, you can't tell how much it supplies unless you're specifically told. So, yep. No, but that's a, that's a good question. Like legitimate, good question. Um, and you guys are going to be expected to be able to get there pretty quickly. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So why when you were writing the mathematics definition why is that odd? So the mathematical definition of current up here? Because our current can vary as our charge varies. So if our charge distribution, so let's say, so let, let's do a, a quick thing up here with some easy math, right? So let's say that Q of T is equal to T squared, right? I of T would then be 2T. So I still varies with time. So I'm just doing a generic case for if I needs to vary with time. Now, obviously, if we had a linear relationship, it would be a constant thing. So if I... If Q were just a simple function of time, not time squared, time cubed, cosine, blah, 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 we, we can get a DC current out of a simple linear charge relationship. But we're not always going to have nice, simple linear charge relationships. So just mathematically covering my ass. Any other questions? All right. So... Let's now talk about power and energy. Okay. So let's start with power. Mathematically, power, and again, covering my butt here, we're gonna define it as a time varying quantity, although that won't always be the case, <laughs> is the derivative of energy with respect to time, which could be expressed as 
the derivative of energy with respect to charge multiplied by the derivative of charge with respect to time, where this is just a fancy expression of voltage and this is current. So power is simply the product of voltage and current, or if you want to do it like you did in the engineering 120 series and call it I times V. So you can say, I've got the power as a handy mnemonic device, do that. I don't care what order you multiply things in and neither does math, okay? So fundamentally, power in this class will always be expressed as the product of current and voltage, okay? Um, we are going to develop a couple of other relationships later on specific to particular components, but this is our meat and potatoes definition that we're going to use the overwhelming majority of the time. Now our word definition of power. Is going to be. the rate of energy transfer, the rate of energy, sorry, I put too many ofs here, of a component where that energy transfer means that energy could be absorbed or supplied, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Energy mathematically is the integral of power where the integration occurs over two specific instants in time. And from this, we can say that energy is the total amount of power transferred by a component. during a fixed time interval. Okay. So when you get your power bill, you're actually getting your energy bill. And it's like a you guys probably aren't paying bills a whole hell of a lot yet, which is wonderful for you guys. Um, let, let's talk about some, some units here, okay? Um, so the unit of power is the watt, um, which for us is simply the product of a volt times an amp. The unit of energy is the joule which is a fundamental unit. Um, but in a lot of industries, we don't use Joule for, ener uh, for energy. So if you get your parents' electric bill or whatever, you'll likely see that the energy is expressed in kilowatt hours. Energy consumption or power times the time, okay? So, Kilowatt hour is another unit that you might see, things like that. Uh, we're not going to get into the details. I just wanted you to, to be aware of this other very commonly used industrial unit for energy. Okay. Um, all right. So let's see. I want to talk about passive sign convention now. 
So this passive sign convention thing is very, very important. I'm going to try to explain it in the easiest way that I possibly can. Uh, the reason why I say it's very, very important is because it establishes a baseline for how we are going to treat quantities, okay? Um, so we're going to use the passive sign convention where that effectively means that whenever anything is absorbing power or energy, we give it a plus sign. And whenever anything is supplying power or energy, we kind of give it a minus sign, okay? So here's how the passive sign convention works. Let's say that I have a generic circuit element. That is part of a larger circuit. And for the sake of argument, I'm going to call this element A, okay? Let's say, additionally, that there is a voltage drop across element A, positive polarity on top, negative polarity on bottom, and there is a current IA flowing through element A. Anybody got any questions right now about what's going on before we hit this with matter? Okay, so generic circuit element. There's a voltage drop across it. There is a current flowing through it, okay? So in this particular case, the current IA is flowing into the positive polarity terminal, okay? So whenever we have this condition, current is flowing into the positive polarity terminal. The power absorbed by element A is simply the product of VA and IA. Okay. Now, at no point whatsoever have I specified whether VA or IA are positive or negative quantities, okay? So I'm not saying in this case that we are always going to get a positive number or a negative number. I am simply saying that whatever mathematically we get by multiplying VA in the way that we've defined it and IA in the way that we've defined it will give us the amount of power that is absorbed, okay? So anytime current flows into the positive polarity terminal, we consider that absorbing power. That might be a positive quantity, it might be a negative quantity, but it's absorbing. The power that is supplied by element A will be negative VA times IA. Okay. So absorbed power and supplied power are the same quantity but of opposite direction effectively because the energy transfer is happening in the opposite way, right? Now let's consider the case with element B over here on the right. Let's say that element B has a voltage drop of VB across it. And there is a current IB flowing through element B such that the current is flowing into the negative polarity term. Okay. In this case, the power absorbed by element B is negative VB IB, and the power supplied by element B is positive 
VB times IB. This is all the passive sign convention is. Seems pretty simple, right? Anything wild, wacky, or weird? No, half of you are gonna make mistakes on this. And it just, it, it is what it is. I'm not trying to be insulting in any way, shape or form. I am a jackass with a PhD and every now and then I still make a mistake with this, okay? It is very simple and straightforward. It is literally just, you want the current to flow into the positive polarity terminal if you're trying to calculate absorbed power. You want the current to flow into the negative polarity terminal if you're trying to calculate supplied power and just use I times V as your power relation. Doesn't have to be any more difficult than that. Now, the reason why I'm harping on this so much is because I'm an asset. And what I mean by that very specifically is that this material, this specific thing is gonna show up on every test that you're gonna take in this class. It's gonna show up in most of your homework assignments, in class assignments and all that kind of stuff. On your exams, which are multiple choice, Again, I am an asshole. I will put a positive value and a negative value that have the exact same thing numerically, but the opposite signs, meaning that I expect you to be able to determine what the correct answer is for absorbed or the correct answer is for supplied, okay? You have been forewarned. I cannot tell you how many students I have who have made an 88 on a test or something like that, that literally should have been 100 because they were screwing this up. So just warning you now, you're gonna have so many in-class assignment problems, so many homework problems, things like that, that are, you're going to get the right answer numerically, and then you are going to, uh, but web work or whatever is gonna tell you it's wrong. And the correct answer is of the opposite sign. This is why the correct answer is of the opposite sign. If you can burn this into your brain now, it will save you so much headache, okay? I cannot encourage you enough to literally write this dumb little diagram down on the top of your paper whenever you're working homework or anything in this class until it is seared into your gray matter, all right? It's gonna save you a lot of headache if you just reinforce this over and over and over again, okay? All right. Um, so I don't know what I did with the example problem that I usually just have written down. So we're going to do something a little nice, I guess. I'm going to pull up web work and we're going to work one of your homework problems. I mean, your answers are obviously going to be different. I also want to point out a couple of annoying things that I've been too lazy to change because I don't know how to program in Perl. Um, all right, so let's look at homework set number one. This is simply current and charge relationships. We covered that, no problem. Um, energy and power relationships, nothing particularly wild here. This is our passive sign convention stuff, not the one I particularly want to look at. Uh, let's see. Charge and current relationships, nothing wild here. This guy, okay. So, I'm gonna redraw this circuit. Let's do it down here. So we have a voltage source. And then a current source with this direction. Voltage source. Actually, so let's put positive minus.
and these aren't explicitly given on the web work, so I'm going to draw them in here. Um, effectively, the web work assumes that you know Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law already to some extent, which you all absolutely should because you've had it before. I am going to just make the assumption that you're not super on board with it yet, and so I'm going to write down a couple of extra things, okay? All right, so um, quantity V1 is 8.5 volts. So this is 8.5 volts. Uh, the quantity V2 is negative 6.5 volts. Um, let's see, I2 is 1 amp. And while I'm at it, V3 is 15 volts. I3 is negative one amp. I4 is negative three and a half amps. Uh, let's see, V5 is 15 and a half. V6 is 30.5. And that current I6 is negative three and a half amps. All right, and while I'm here, let's call this element one, two, three, four, five, and six, okay? So, the question asks us, which of the DC sources are supplying power? This is misleading, okay? What it actually means is which of the DC sources are supplying positive power, okay? Um, technically, we could say that any of them are supplying power because we can just ab uh, absorb power as negative supplied power. So that's why I think that question is very, very generic. Um, and I don't particularly care for it. And then if you check the boxes, if you're just looking at current flowing into the negative polarity terminal as supply power, you'll also get it wrong. What is it, what it is it specifically asking for is which of the DC sources are supplying positive power. So that's what we're going to work, okay? So let's look at element one. Okay. Um, let me get my roll sheet so I can just randomly call on folks. Tyler Cochran, what is the voltage drop across element one? Where are you at, Tyler? Right there, okay. Eight and a half volts, okay. So the voltage drop across element one, so let, let's start here, P1. So the voltage drop is eight and a half volts. Um, Hannah Madden, what is the current flowing through element one? Where are you at, right there? Okay, one amp. All right, and go to this third page here. Uh, Caleb Neal, is the current flowing into the negative polarity terminal or positive polarity terminal? For element one. It's flowing into the negative polarity terminal, okay. So since we are calculating supplied power, 
do we need to add a negative sign or not? No, right? Because we are calculating supplied power and the current is already flowing into the negative polarity terminal, I times V is equal to the supplied power. So for element one, we are supplying eight and a half watts of power. So we would check the box for this, okay? Now let's look at element two. John Neal, what is the voltage drop across element two? So I think it says negative six and a half volts, positive polarity on the left, right? Yeah, that, that I might have just written it too small, so I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt on that one. All right. Um, Rhea, what is the current flowing through element two? One amp. All right. Um, let's see. Tyler Wendling, is the current flowing into the positive polarity terminal or the negative polarity terminal? Where are you at? Right there? Yeah. So the current is flowing into the positive polarity terminal. That's correct. Since the current is flowing into the positive polarity terminal and we are trying to calculate supplied power, what do we need to do? Add a negative sign. Absolutely right. So negative times negative six and a half volts is positive six and a half times one amp. So this comes out to be positive six and a half watts. So element two is also supplying positive power. Anybody have any question about that? It's perfectly okay if you do, okay? All right, let's look at element three. Three, what is the voltage drop across element three? Thank you, ma'am. Um, Cameron, what is the current flowing through element three? Is the current, uh, actually, sorry, let me ask somebody else. Um, Trey. Is the current flowing into the positive polarity terminal or the negative polarity terminal for element three? The negative polarity terminal. So do we need to add a negative sign or not? No, all right. So in this case, we are supplying negative 15 watts of power, which is the same as absorbing positive 15 watts. We would not check the box for this particular element and then so forth and so forth. That's the level of detail that is required to do this. It is literally just, is the current flowing into the negative polarity terminal or the positive polarity terminal? What am I trying to calculate? Do I need to add a negative sign? That's as hard as it has to be, honestly, okay? And you guys can do the rest of these. Uh, unless you had any questions, I'm happy to continue doing it, but I have talked for an hour and a half and I'm sure you're tired of hearing my voice. So keep going or let you guys work stuff. You guys work. All right, sounds great. All right, I'm done ranting now. Um, <clears throat> so your in-class assignment is up here. Uh, we were supposed to have a lab for today, but I talked for too damn long. So we'll do the lab on, after the lecture on um, Monday. So that'll give you guys a little bit more time to go spend 10 bucks down the hall if you haven't already done so. Here are the in-class assignments. I'm lazy, come grapple. <laughs> 